Going live in three, two, one, and you're live. Welcome, um, everybody, to week four of the Siegel Talks here from New York City at the Graduate Center CUNY at the City University of New York. Um, it's a little bit a colder day and uh, we are in the, in the first weeks of the programming. Actually, we, I think we are the only institution in New York City, perhaps in the US, creating daily new programs um, and not uh, um, uh, um, uh, showing what is already out there. And we always felt it is important to listen to artists, to theater artists, to hear their voices and to, to um, actually also listen carefully. And we had uh, right now, um, participants from Egypt, Lebanon, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Belgium, Italy, uh, and so many, um, many countries. And uh, uh, this Monday, we have a truly totally a special guest with us. It's the great um, Mila Rao um, from Switzerland, who is based in Belgium at Ghent um, at the moment. For many people, um, he represents the very best, the very innovative, uh, the most uh, thought-provoking uh, approach to a contemporary new theater of like what we have in our little press release we write new forms are needed for the new times we live in that's what Brecht said and Milo already had done that he has been a frequent guest at the Siegel Center's film festivals we tried once or twice to get him over here and um, it didn't work out because he's a really hard hard worker he's a uh, really dedicating his work and life um, to it. He has done great shows like the Zurich Trikes, the Congo Tribunal, the Moscow Trials. He has done a play about Ceausescu, uh, Five Easy Pieces. And they all create a new work where the documentary theater, uh, uh, classic theater, theater that uh, in a Brechtian sense uh, uh, provokes thinking ultimately to take action. Um, um, takes hold and um, he uh, really uh, is a, a brilliant uh, a young uh, director. He just also did in Mosul in Iraq, he did Orestaya, the uh, wonderful actress, uh, Suzu uh, um, Abdul-Majid, who I also know, you know, worked with him. She was the Cassandra and uh, she told me a lot about the work he did there and I know it's in the film now. He is cutting at the moment a film about the life uh, of Jesus and, and so many, many other things. These times which we have now here, uh, Milo, um, first of all, welcome, is about, you know, to make meaning about, about it and to think. We are bombarded with voices from politicians, virologists, economic advisors, but we really need to hear also from the artists. Artists traditionally have been on the right side of history, on the right side of social progress, on the right side of what is the truth. And we would love to know and hear from you, you are sitting, I, I assume, in Ghent, or you're in Germany, or in Switzerland, I mean, where are you at the moment? I'm in, in Cologne, in, in Germany. It's not far from Ghent, from two hours from, from, it's in the very west from, from Germany, at the border to, to Belgium. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Family, thank I'm you. living there. How, what, what time is it now in the Cologne? It's uh, 6, 6, 5. 6, 5 six p.m. hours later, yeah. So you live with your, who's your family? You live with... Uh, so my girlfriend, uh, my, my girlfriend, she's also the graphic designer of all my uh, projects. And then I have uh, two, two daughters. So uh, the four so of us are now in this, this apartment here and um, since three weeks. Um, how, how long is the quarantine now in, in, uh, in uh, the confinement in, in, in New York? How long are you at home now? Yeah, I think it's like over four or five weeks now, yes. and uh, it got uh, was very loose, as you know. Trump says, you know, he's not not wearing a mask, but people should wear a mask. So, but it's yeah. it's a very serious situation. New York and the state of New York has more dead, and than most states or any state in the world. Then, and yeah, um, true. And so we are we are really um, um, stunned um, by all of it. Um, and of course, if you look at numbers, and we talked about it earlier, um, we had Aristide for. Tanaga from Burkina Faso on the program, he said 400,000 people die of malaria every year in Africa. The world doesn't stop that we don't even have money to uh, have measles, measles vaccinations. Uh, in India, Anna Rupa Roy was, uh, told us about it, 500,000 people are trying to leave New Delhi on foot because all the service people, the disenfranchised, who are no longer allowed in the homes of the people they serve so faithfully, and they were trying to walk home, some of them uh, up to a thousand kilometers. It was a biblical yeah. things are happening. So it puts us also in perspective. We don't hear these stories, also not in the New York Times, 
uh, as much, especially not from India. And um, and so, how is it in, uh, in 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 Ghent in in Belgium? Are you connected to the theater scene there? Do you what do you hear from Belgium? Yeah, I think it's uh, more or less the same like like in Germany. I mean, here it's a bit. Um, let's say a little bit better organized, a little uh, less aggressive than in, in, in Belgium because uh, the Belgian state is, as you know, a bit dysfunctional, I have to uh, confess. And um, <laughs> um, in a good and in a bad way sometimes, but of course they are very disciplined too. So now it's, uh, it's we are over the peak, I guess. So it's slowly going down again and uh, the discussion is open now to weaken the, the confinement to for example in one week my younger daughter will go to school again i don't know how it is in the in the in, in new york in the us but, uh, unthinkable at the moment yeah unthinkable unthinkable yeah. so here slowly it's taking back of course you have like kind of experts from both sides saying when we go back now like on 1919 with the Spanish flu uh, it will come back then even stronger so you don't know and um, yeah I think uh, you, you you mentioned the malaria case and um, uh, of in, in for example in Africa where you have dying people thousands and thousands all the time without any measures without any media coverage and of course in, in Corona uh, one positive thing you could say that it started in the in the rich centers of the globalized uh, world so mm -hmm. immediately there there was an answer of course to it so it's it's that's that's on the one hand a good thing on the other hand of course now it's also spreading to the whole rest of the world you mentioned india uh, where it started a bit later i was just like three weeks ago three and a half weeks ago i was still in the in the north of brazil to stage the uh, the Antigone, and they are also a bit, I think, comparable to uh, to to the U.S. Uh, there is not a real clear strategy uh, from the from the government of uh, of Jair Bolsonaro. So he's also more or less blocking his institutions, giving very chaotic advice to uh, to the media and to the uh, um, to the officials. He just dismissed his health minister three three days ago, four days ago. So it's, I mean, in every country you feel it depends uh, strongly from the reaction of the government. On the other hand, from how is the civil uh, society organized? How do they, how do they take it? In and your in rehearsals were, were interrupted in Brazil. You couldn't, you couldn't finish uh, your project, right? The Antigone project was interrupted. No, it, was, uh, it was at one moment we decided, I mean, it was a bit strange. It was quite interesting to see because when I arrived in uh, in Brazil, uh, it was one week to the lockdown in Europe. And when they locked down, so they closed my theater uh, when I was absent in Brazil and I had to take all these decisions from very far. But I didn't take, it was quite strange, I didn't take it personal. So it was kind of, okay, this is happening in Europe, but in north of Brazil, nothing arrives, uh, although not uh, Corona at all. And it was also a bit, I'm, I'm working together with the landless movement there, and they are activists. And of course, you have a big, big optimism of the will in a, in a social movement. And you think, if you go on, it will not happen. So you have this on the bed and on the bed. <coughs> And then after some days, we decided that it was too dangerous because activists from all the country prepared themselves to come up to, to the north to, to participate in the project. And then we stopped it and we postponed it to, uh, to November. And uh, I went in quarantine to the south, to Sao Paulo, waited there from, for some time until I got, we, we got the flight. And then we went back to Amsterdam, so to Europe. To Europe. Um, and Milo, um, you created a Ghent manifesto when you took over the theater in Ghent. And I think if, if I'm right, paragraph number one is it's no longer about portraying the world. It's uh, about changing it. How does Corona, is that come in for you? That is, is that also changing your thought about or is it confirming what you already thought? Yeah, uh, both things. I'm, I'm, I can, I can feel it myself, and I can, of course, see it in Europe. Uh, you have, it's, it's a very mixed situation. On the one side, the globalization is stopped because you, uh, for example, you have in Europe even the European Union is kind of postponed for later. The national states are going back. The borders are closed, and you can see in the outside borders of Europe, you can feel how 
uh, even almost a bit uh, fascist, this, this new uh, state of emergency is that they blocked the, the refugee camps. People are blocked in, in Greece, in South Italy. They can't go out anymore. Everything is blocked and every nation, if you want, uh, they are taking care of themselves. So kind of you could say that the, the global solidarity is stopped for some time. On the other hand, you have, and this is a kind of a very, you could say anarchistic joy, I even uh, feel a bit, uh, that the whole big mega machine, the capitalistic mega machine is stopped from one moment to the other. That uh, big industries, for example, Mercedes, Adidas, etc., are kind of halfly nationalized, Volkswagen even. So they got a lot of financial support. And now for me, the big question is, what, what is the next step? How do we democratize? How do we actually politicize this situation? What is the things we are asking to these big industries? What is Volkswagen producing after Corona? How, how are we going on with this uh, experience we have now? Because for me, it's kind of, a, you could say, a, a general rehearsal to the climate crisis. So how can we stop the machine? How can we act together? So we can learn, I think, a lot out of this, but we can also, and I feel it even in, in my own theater, I feel it in the whole uh, artistic field, that everybody is planning kind of from the moment on when we will take again from September, October, November, or December, or even January, but just to restart with what we did before. And I think now we should really take a time, take this gap to think, how can we make differently theater? For example, you were talking about the form of doing theater. So I have a, the biggest house we have in Ghent. It's a 19th century hall, 700 people in it. And this will only open in perhaps January that you can play there again. So we are waiting, <laughs> thinking in, into the architecture of the 19th century, you know? And perhaps mm -hmm. we should go to other places. We should go to the virtual space or to just outside in the street to smaller spaces we should have another way of, of thinking theater after this uh, after this crisis and then um, there's a lot of of of, of uh, new forms being developed at that very moment as i said for example uh, people is restarting doing theater in small spaces in europe there is of course all the tryouts in the virtual space which are starting to connect there are rehearsals online you have a lot of, and I think for me, it's one of the most uh, positive effects that we found out how many discussions we can have without taking a flight, for example. So we can discuss, we never discussed before, because we said, okay, if we don't have the opportunity that I fly to New York or you fly here, we will not do it. Now we do it because we have to do it. And we get, uh, okay. we get used to it. So it's, it's uh, for me, we take quite fast, many big steps. On the other hand, uh, making theater, so I'm working now mostly on my films in that moment, in the last three weeks, making theater, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a genre medium of presence. And I, 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 I learned how, how, how true this is. When I want to do a, an Antigone with the landless movement with indigenous people in Brazil, I have to be there with these people. Of course, I'm, I'm exchanging with Kaisara, my, my Antigone in the play, uh, the indigenous activist who plays Antigone. We are exchanging by Skype and Zoom and we are writing a speech together or the play, but uh, it's not that we, uh, that we can really rehearse because it's very, it's not working dialectically. It's really like, I, I, I don't really, I don't really like it. But at the same time, a lot of decisions uh, we have to take in and again, for example, we can take it now what took like, four hours before we can do in 15 minutes in a video call so we are kind of smoother than before so this is this is on the positive side and just when we are talking about about the functioning of the of the of the institution but i really really think that we should now take this gap this stop to rethink what we do on stage on which stage with whom and in in, in what time frames what do you think uh, in general should change in theater? Not just in your, because you, you already do so different, but what do you feel, what hasn't been working in, in general, or maybe just share your, your, um, your thoughts, why it should be different? 
Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I was uh, reading a lot in the last week. So I was preparing the Antigone and I was writing a text about Oedipus, King Oedipus. So I was like, <laughs> like diving into the tragic mind. And I was asking myself, why do we still play these plays today? There are only 32 tragedies that, we, that came from Greek times to us. So why are we continuing to play this? And I think because these are really tragic play that show an antagonism that we can't solve. That there is a problem that is not just dramatic, but somehow insolvable. There is a tragic problem. And I think we are at that very moment confronted with a situation that is tragic, that we have to rethink the system we are living in. It's not just that we can make it a bit smoother and we can put a bit of green energy or whatever and it will go on. No, we have to stop that machine once forever or we'll, we will be fucked and we deserve it. And I think this, to understand, really understand this, and to make, to give a sensitivity to it, to give stories to it, to give forms to it, that we start to live in this kind of tragic moment as a, as a culture, as a civilization, like the Greeks did in the fifth century before Christ, when they decided to develop this art form we still use, because they had, they were, confronted to huge changings in their civilization. So a really a time change. And I think we should come back to this and we should find forms to translate what the experts and what the scientists tell us since, since 50, 60, 100 years. We know what will happen in 10 or 15 or 20 years. We know everything about the climate collapse. We know what happens to, to India, to Europe, to US, to Africa, etc. in not a lot of time during our generation but we can't feel it because we can't tell it and we don't have any way of, let's say, knowledge to connect what we know and what we can do as a society. So we have to reconnect on it and I think theatre plays a role in giving, giving a symbolic space to, uh, to, this, to this learning action and trying out possible actions. You, you, you introduced me with, uh, with, with mentioning the, 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 the trials, for example. I did the Congo Tribunal. This is a tribunal we did because we saw we have a transnational economy, we have a globalized economy, but we have not a globalized economic law. So if you are pushed out of your land, let's say as a Congolese citizen from a Canadian or a US or a Swiss uh, enterprise, there's no tribunal you can appeal to. So we created it. We created the theater tribunal, but the real one with real advocates, with real witnesses, with real cases, and it somehow became real. And I think oh, you quoted in the beginning Bertolt Brecht, who said, theater is a, is a stage where you learn to act politically. You represent, of course, you have to represent, you have to let know, you perhaps you have to, to declare stuff sometimes, or you just have... I mean, I, I like theater also in, as an emotional machine. I'm much more Stanislavski than, than Brecht ever was. I mean, in the, to be true, eh, the, uh, Brecht, he used uh, the techniques of Stanislavski too. He just didn't, yeah, yeah. didn't uh, label them. But um, on the other hand, of course, I think that theater is a new topic tool, much more, for example, than, than, than movies can be, because movies you have always disconnected. You have never a public connected to a very life moment where you have to decide, for example, on the one or the other side, or you have really a presence of somebody, etc., etc. And you also see that at that very moment of disconnection, it's theater that is disconnected the most. So we are losing, I think, a theater makers much more. What I'm doing now, I'm writing, I'm, I'm editing films, I'm talking through the camera, so I can continue with almost everything but not the social life. I can't go demonstrating and I can't go uh, making theater. So actually the political sphere is blocked. And that means that theater as a political tool is blocked too. Mm. <clears throat> you said um, it's about stopping the machine. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, at, we somehow didn't stop the, you couldn't say we didn't stop the machine ourselves as a civic society because we are just following the measures of our governments and we are very disciplined doing it. And 
before this happened, there was, of course, the idea of having a kind of a green dictatorship and you would have like rules that you have to follow. So you can't use your car on Wednesdays and on Saturdays, or I don't know. And, mm. uh, and I think what we have to do now is, of course, to translate because that's how we are functioning. I think we should, we should now stop with the neoliberal idea that everything should be free to do or not to do and that we are only individuals and we can't act together. We, we learn now that we can act together, but it has to be somehow, uh, there have to be kind of, of rules that we now decide all together. I think now it's really the moment of take the next step and like, as I said, politizing or democratizing uh, this state of emergency we are living in. We have to decide now, okay, we learned this, 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 what are we doing now? How is, for example, uh, uh, the parliament uh, controlling the economy? Which is it doing now 100%? How are we doing it in the future? How we are organizing all this stuff in the future? And then we can decide on this. And I think here I'm extremely positive after this experience of, of Corona, that even uh, a state like, 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 uh, like Brazil, where just the solidarity of the civil society saves the country. You have strong institutions and they save the people. So you have a, you see, we are really prepared, not only in the West, also in, in I mean, also in the, in the whole rest of the world, we are quite well prepared to, to take these steps to avoid the climate collapse. So I think this is a very good, uh, um, as I said, a very good general rehearsal to show that we can, go down with the machine, but now when we start again, we should do it following the, the things we learned or we have to learn now. And we should continue continue on the on the on the on the on the how to call it on this kind of halfly uh, nationalized um, way of, of of dealing for example with the economy. That is incredible. So um, using this theater as a symbolic space, as a, as a model for something, let's say the Brazilian um, the work of the Antigone, you show a possible world. And if it's possible on stage, it might be possible in life. People will think that that's why some governments don't like theater. The uh, Tia Varsova, um, who is uh, creating new political work, says, you know, this is why what we like to do. This is why we, we do theater. And um, we had uh, also Abhishek who said, you know, they asked him, how is your theater effective in India? He said, I don't know. Ask the government. They're forbidding it. It means it's something is going to, is happening. There are films 20 million people see or more or one TV series, you know, and, uh, but my, my small plays get forbidden. Yours also have been, um, in, have a hard time in some places. They were censored. Um, do you feel your theater is, is a very open political activist theater? Um, I'm, I'm doing um, plays or actions that are uh, extremely directly uh, uh, political, like these this tribunals or trials. Or for example, we were talking shortly about the Jesus film in preparation of this, uh, Tell of us this talk, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the new gospel. Uh, a film I made in, in, in South Italy, in Matera, where uh, Pasolini, uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini, a director I like a lot, did a Jesus film in the 60s, and then Mel Gibson did a quite trashy uh, version of the last part of The Passion of the Christ, called The Passion of the Christ, in the, I think, 2004. And uh, I brought the actors from Pasolini and the Mel Gibson together in last autumn to make a new uh, Jesus film. But when I came there, I saw it just would have been an aesthetic action to do it because Matera, the capital of uh, culture in Europe in 2019, is surrounded by refugee camps, illegalized people, 500,000 people. And the whole Italian agriculture is working because these people is, uh, is cheap, uh, are cheap workers and they are under the control of mafia. They are doing the whole uh, tomato and uh, and. Uh, orange, etc., etc. work. So without these 500 people, without uh, the illegalized people there, it wouldn't work. And then I said, okay, what would Jesus do? Who would Jesus be today? And I found a Cameroon activist, um, Ivan Sanye, who was working on the plantation 10 years ago, doing the first strike against uh, the mafia. 
and I asked him if he wants to play my cheeses. Uh, and then I asked him, um, but how did you do your strike? How was it possible? Because of course, there's the, the strategy of dividing people by, by identity politics. So uh, a Cameroon people, uh, somebody from Cameroon wouldn't work with somebody from Congo, wouldn't work with somebody from, from Romania. And of course, the mafia is dealing with this divided impera. And they, he told me, I made it like this. I had 12 sub leaders from the 12 <laughs> different countries people were coming from. And I said, ah, wow, 12 sub leaders. This remembers really Jesus. So search your 12 sub leaders and your 12 apostles. And we found 12 activists from 12 different uh, um, societies living there uh, in the refugees camps or outside sex workers, etc. And uh, we united them. And then we made, together with the actors from Mel Gibson and the Mac actors still alive from Pasolini, for example, his Jesus became our John the Baptist. Uh, we made this film again, and there's one part, so we will edit it now. We are more or, less, uh, more or less finished, and we will finish in the film the next weeks. But at the same time, we founded what we call the Houses of Dignity, uh, Casa della Dignità. So we occupied houses, because you have this, this absurd contradiction in the, in, the, in the refugee law in Europe that if you don't have a place where you live, you don't have the possibility to work and to get papers. And you, if you don't have get papers, you can't have a house, you know? So um, true, yeah. you, are, you are in between all the time. So we occupied and we pushed the state and the Catholic church to accept these houses. And that's how these people became legal. And uh, that was one outcome, or is still one outcome, of this, this, this project we did. So there was a film, a Jesus film, at the, same hand, uh, at, the same, at the same time a political action. And I would say it's very difficult to say, what is it now? Because when you watch the film, you would see parts of the revolt, parts of this, this uh, political action, but you would also see a Jesus film. So I think uh, as an artist, you are always at with one foot in an aesthetical world, in a, in a we, we call it symbolical world, metaphorical world, that you do as if, and on the other hand, what you do as if has an impact uh, in the real world that it becomes real. Of course, you have to push it. Huh? But when the first parliament was, 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 was created in Europe, in, in France, in the, in the 18th to the end of the 18th century, the king was saying, but guys, you just invented that you are the parliament. You are not. You are just people from the provinces. And they said, no, we are the parliament. We are the nation, nation now. We are now the legal power. And he had just to accept it. And in the end, he even lost his head. So this is another story. But every time when humans are working, and I studied at the, uh, sociology at Bourdieu, uh, every social action is, a, is a, in the beginning a theatrical action, of course. So there is what seems to us just the reality, the social reality is the normalization of acts of creation that other generations or perhaps even ourselves did at the moment. So art becomes quite simply real. For me, it was like every time I do projects or I, list, I look to other projects, to books, uh, to films, it's not only theater, of course, uh, I'm impressed how small this step is from, from what you could call a creation, uh, an invention to something that seems real to everybody. Uh, I, re I remember even in the soft power side, in, 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 uh, in, in, in the politics of, of, of images, when we did uh, the Jesus film and we had this uh, black Jesus, uh, at one moment we had a, a, a discussion in one, in one village, we had a lot of discussions with the public, etc. And uh, an activist uh, was asked by the public, but what is the outcome of this? Because uh, it's just a film. It's, it's, it's... And he said, you know, that's the first black Jesus we have in Europe in the film history. And when the next comes, it will just be normal that there is like a, like a black president. It will be the next one. And then uh, some days later, I had a discussion with my, with my children because we have the first female counselor, uh, Angela Merkel in Germany. And I was telling them, listen, um, they will vote for a new councillor in a year. And uh, perhaps it's, it's this guy. And it was a, a male. And, uh, and my daughter said, ah, I didn't know that the man can also become councillor. I thought only women can become councillor. 
because Angela Merkel is the only one she knows, you know. And there for you a can, long time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for a long time. <laughs> and there you can see how, <clears throat> how uh, I don't know, how simple you can like kind of, 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 of create uh, kind of a normality of, of, of whatever in the good and in the bad sense, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the bad sense, of course, we have a lot of examples here in, in Europe and all over the world, what you say, what is normal and what isn't, you know. So I think broaden this idea of normality, um, which is quite simple actually in, 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 uh, in the arts, is one of the main projects. So it's, it's a, and then of course the question is when you start to, it's, it's an act to do it, but when you start to make an institution out of it, of a parliament, for example, then the question is, but who can be in the parliament? Who invented the parliament? And of course, France, the parliament in France stayed for a very long time uh, the parliament of rich white men. So I think, uh, you know, so you have to think as a permanent revolution. You have to reinstall, reinstall, reinvent all the time uh, what you did. Because the biggest revolutionaries, of course, the day after the revolution, they became the most conservatory people <laughs> in the world. So right. this is the this is the the problem we are in. Uh, also, when you create new forms of theater. So when, for example, we 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 tried to uh, create new forms. Or ten ye years ago, somebody you should invite is the group Rimini Protocol from from Europe. Yeah, next week they are. Ah, next week they yes. are. Yes. So for me, this is a very good example because they are like kind of 10 years older than I am. They created in Europe, huh? it was not new, but they really somehow installed it as a, as a, as a, as a form uh, that not actors on stage, but people like you and me telling, called experts, telling about our daily life experience. So when they would make a play about Marx, so they would perhaps invite uh, somebody who was leftist at a certain time or so, et cetera, you know, or when they talk about death, they would invite somebody who is close to dying, et cetera. So this was, this was at that moment, it was new because it was very not metaphysical. They didn't invite children because they are, um, they are very authentic because they wanted to know what children know. So this very sociological approach to make theater uh, was around 2000, very new in Europe. And then you could wait like three or four years and it became uh, in the big city theaters like the way to do it. So in every shitty Shakespeare mise-en-scene, you would have like two or three real people making it authentic and telling about whatever they lived in their lives, you know? So it became very fast, um, um, how to say, a, a classical tool of, of bourgeois theater. So it's, it's, it goes very fast. So you have to to stay smooth and also accept that you have to, to leave behind stuff and that you have to rethink your forms you are using. I'm, for example, I'm a lot of times criticized by what we are doing because it's megalomaniac, because it's kind of neocolonialistic, because it's et cetera, et cetera. Because international solidarity, when you go to the Amazon and you work there and doing a, an Antigone, of course you can ask, but why Antigone? Why Antigone, why bring a European play from 2000 years ago, written by a white man like Sophocles, why bring it to the Amazon? Isn't this kind of, of, of neocolonialism? And then you have to think it and you have to discuss it and you have to devel develop it with the people you are working there. And we, we were chanceful because they said we had to kind of explain the Antigone for five minutes. And they said, of course, we understand Bolsonaro, that's Creon, uh, Antigone, that's a traditional society that is, is being erased by, by the, by the agro-business, etc. So they understood immediately what it is about. Um, but then they ch started immediately also to rewrite the texts. For example, in the Greek tragedy, everybody suicides in the end. And they said, sorry, but uh, in a social movement like the landless movement, you would never suicide. So we don't accept to suicide in the end. And then you have to think, okay, okay. And then it really becomes an Antigone in the Amazon, you know? So how you dive in, how you can adapt, and, and uh, how can you, yeah, how can you really take the context as a, as, I mean, the, you, you quoted the first, point of the Ghent Manifesto saying that rea realism doesn't mean that you depict something real, but that the depicted or the act of depiction creates new reality. And of course, the best is if it's even political change, if you can kind of 
engage in a situation that is unjust and it changes through the process of creating a play. So this is, of course, uh, it's very beautiful. Yeah, this is incredible. You know, theater is the space of a, the real, the imagined, the symbolic, and um, also of representation, and that actually it is uh, powerful and uh, important. It's, it made me think of that famous uh, sentence, uh, what you said, of uh, the revolution will be televised in a way you say now the revolution will be performed. You know, people will perform acts of uh, revolution, whether it's in theater or outside and activism and that the lines and blur and that symbolic uh, uh, um, meaning that the remedy brought the everyday people in into the theater, you know, that perhaps was, I mean, this means everyday people are part of politics, you know, everyday people are part of the machine, all this. And so it means it's a changing that you keep it in mind. Like you said, yeah, well, I had to rethink Antigone. I couldn't just do it because, you know, people have, I have studied sociology. I know Bourdieu and, uh, and uh, Todorov. We uh, um, have to think and adapt. And uh, I know you often have like only 20% of the classic texts left and you rework it. Interesting, uh, Anurupa Roy from India on the call said, you know, she's thinking about redoing the Mahabharata, which is now used by mm -hmm. state television. Yeah. It's a, a almost, you know, a right-wing tool. Um, yeah. yet we reform it, we change things. And so these are other ways of looking at it. And people are stunned. They can't yeah. imagine. She said they performed in front of 400 right-wing military people. And then their car was blocked when they got out and they were afraid of well, their lives almost. And they said, no, I can't. can you come out and tell, is that really true what you told us? You know, she said, so he said, I'm going to do this place about uncertainty where it's not clear how it comes out yeah. and, and that. So, um, that is, that is interesting. So um, is anything changing? I mean, you are three weeks in the, at your home. Um, is something, do you feel something inside you is changing or are you in contact with something that you normally are not or is it good or bad? But is something, do you feel this is changing you? This yeah, I mean, uh, what is uh, changing in me, you know, I'm, I'm not a really a claustrophobic guy. I always liked sitting at home and writing, but I couldn't do it because I had to, to make theater. So now I can't and I feel like uh, falling back in my students times when I was 20, 21, making projects, not knowing if they will happen, making project A, B, C, D, discussing with people by phone and then planning and have plans, etc. And I like this open space, I have to say, where I'm not kind of very pragmatically involved all the time. So I don't feel a, I don't feel a, a horror vacui, I have to say. I'm very happy to, for example, read the tragedies again, read a book about Simon Critchley, The Tragedy Greeks and Us, a very beautiful book. Uh, I, I read in the last days, I read some writings from Marx, uh, even again. I didn't read since 25 years. And uh, I have a lot of discussions with almost everybody. We are working on a book now called uh, Why Theatre? Um, and we are asking mm -hmm. 100 people all over the world to contribute to this book, to ask ourselves, but what will happen? Social activists, like cl people that makes very classical theatre, like Peter Brook, you know, like very very classical but people you wouldn't like kind of expect in a book with this title so we're really asking ourselves how can we renew the tradition of theater after corona somehow how can there be a, th a theater that announces the post-capitalist times and not in a in a in a, in a broad leftist uh, way of thinking that uh, that is only economical but on a lot of levels and that's why we are asking uh, as you do in your discussions people from the Amazonia, people from India, a lot of people from, from Africa, because there is so many knowledge, uh, especially for theater, for me, um, that, is, that is not coming from Europe or from the tradition from Europe, and especially not from the very uh, moment of now. For example, I'm very happy that the international uh, system of exchanging the same 10 names is now for a moment stopped. Yeah. <laughs> that you don't have these international festivals. I like them a lot, but where is invited just the same people. And now when it stopped, you're kind of waking up out of a dream and asking yourself, um, but why didn't we consider to really think on what we do next season or in the next edition of our festival? Why did we only try to invite the 10 big names and then the 10 local big names and then why didn't we really think what can we change by doing a festival by doing 
a season. And now when we are talking about uh, this Y theater book or about, of course, the next season in, in, uh, in my theater in Antigent and in my company, the IRPM, what are we doing next? We feel a need to do something because we go through all these possible plans to make the choice of a plan that really is worth executing it because we perhaps we can only execute one plan next season so we should take a plan that is is a is, is a good plan or for example when we do uh, antigone i want to do it in the good way in amazonia and i want to i want it's this is this is for me um, um a very uh, a very beautiful moment because I, I i was kind of like i think everybody you know in the capitalism you can you have no work or you have too much work but i think in between is not in neoliberal times, there's you are completely useless, mm -hmm. uh, or you have to work like crazy. And uh, I, I I felt a bit back now in the kind of a, of a, of a, of a healthy middle line where I'm. We have, for example, a lot of talks. People is asking, do you do a talk, a live stream here, a live stream there? And uh, I'm I'm not kind of meeting the people again that I met anyway, like four weeks again and then doing a live stream but I tried to meet the people I wouldn't meet like we really tried several times mm -hmm. <laughs> but we never did it so now we have yeah, yeah. the chance and this is great yeah 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 um so how does your day look like can you walk us through like if you want what do you get what do you do how, how do you structure your day in Cologne how, how do we imagine that so I'm I'm uh, I, I like to, to wake up quite quite early um so and I, I'm writing in the very morning so until from seven seven thirty until noon, uh, and in the afternoon I'm hanging around with my uh, with my with my daughters. Uh, we do a bit of school work, <laughs> but not uh, not too much. Um, mm -hmm. And <laughs> I have some phone calls. I read. Um, we go for walking. It's 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 very possible here. So you can go in the park, for example, if you have some some distance and of course i'm trying to to organize also a bit in the afternoon but i always did it like this that uh, the mornings are always used for writing or rehearsing and the afternoons are used for uh, the real life and the organization of the real life um, because when you wake up you are very fresh um, i yeah i have to say i i for me to switch from from traveling a lot producing a lot to sitting at home um it was uh, extremely natural i uh, of course sometimes it's a bit claustrophobic then uh, i go out or whatever but it's uh, um it's possible i just the only thing you know we have a big big crisis at the moment uh, and i'm doing a lot in petition and political work uh, at, the, at the european borders because we have all this i guess perhaps the same in the south border of of the states uh, we have a lot of people blocked there uh, a lot of young people children even and this is a big big crisis and it's completely impossible to send somebody there or to go there you can't go it's uh, it's it's not possible at the moment so you are really a bit kind of limited to a very um, to write texts to make calls to make uh, petitions but you can't really political work is uh, it's, it's very blocked and on a, that's, that's on, the, on, the, on, the, on the higher institutional level, of course, this is the big problem because we have a lot of things that in Europe change at the very moment, like in every crisis, that you have the kind of political parties and the governments like pushing a lot of economic stuff in a bad way, like fast through when nobody can, can kind of react because there's a state of emergency. So this is... This is problematic, and um, then I'm sitting at home and reading um, a book about the Greeks and the tragedy. And of course, I um, I know that this is not not uh, really helpful in this situation to do this all the reading stuff. So it's uh, yeah. So that's yeah. I think this time is now coming to an end. This time of waiting at home, it, it has to end. It was uh, for some time. It was healthy, but now we have to. To take the decisions out of it we have to act again good and to act means you try you make calls you write letters from home or you mean you, you look forward most probably will open soon in a couple of weeks i mean in germany is different there are plans to open schools go out 
So are you, are you planning to go back to again? Do you think there will be social distancing in theater, like every five seats is one person, one row empty, or, or what? What what are you? What are the plans in Ghent for your theater? I mean, we are officially announced the next season in uh, end of May, um, and then we are uh, we have a plan to go with small units, but this is really in planning to the city and playing outside the theater. I think the theater can now it's officially closed like street uh, theater you're going to go to locations outside in yes. the city of ghent yeah to do starting what? starting from august on yeah we go we have a lot of project next season is called uh, against integration so we are really like we have a whole season that is kind of exploring the possibilities to do theater outside the institution and outside kind of classical acting so we have one project that is called dissident um, where we where we uh, want to work with schools, and then we have another project uh, in Amazonia and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So everything is happening, not in the building, which will mm. be closed until September anyway by law now. By, yeah. by it's impossible. Yeah. In September we will, as you say, start with some, not 600 people, but perhaps 200 and or 100 and. And I, I, I just like some days ago when we were talking about uh, how we do the plan, when do we play the next time? I don't know, our big plays. I was just deciding, let's not wait for it. Let's plan a season that is as if you couldn't open. As yeah, if yeah. Okay. you have really to do a, another theater. Let's, let's start think about this. And I think this is uh, what we have to do because as I said, the very strange thing is that we are adapting to an architecture that was made in the 19th century. Uh, we are adapting to halls that were made and constructed a long time ago, or in the 80s, or in the 90s, during neoliberal times. But this is an architecture that perhaps is not, is not working anymore, or working in a different way. So why take it just as a disadvantage, to, and we have to wait until we can do it in the proper way, then let's do it in another way. That's, that's a fantastic idea. And I think there's a, I haven't heard that approach. I think that makes a lot of sense. Any B person, the choreographer in New York said she was interested in the kind of six foot distance as a choreographer. You know, she says she more or less is a distance. I often tell my dancers, you know, they come together, but if they stay close enough. And so how does it work on the street? People now see each other move through it. So I, I would love to hear if you say you do it outside, let's say on a, on a, on a square in Ghent, will there be, a monologue or people in a costume or will people with a microphone like a guitar player on the street what what are the what will the project look like are you thinking of um, specific uh, scenes to play or is that still open i think that the important thing is perhaps more basic than this because you can do a very bourgeois theater outside uh, a theater space of the 19th century I could, as you said i could just do ask an actor to make a monologue and yeah. then if he makes the monologue inside or outside i think this is only very stupid people will think that this is then a very revolutionary theater if you do this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it's just a trick and right. um and um uh, i think we should kind of step out of the tricks because we had these kind of tricks going in the streets that started i don't know in the 20s and then in the 60s and then again and again but what are we doing outside? Are we occupying? What is the, the action we are doing? With whom are we working? Who is holding this monologue? This, this for example, school voice in school. How are we developing with it? An university for what, you know? Is it an university of resistance? Is it an university to create new ways of writing theater, of playing theater, of creating the institution of theater that you really can take this moment to transform it because when we just now send out our specialists of doing theater in a square and then the, the light guy makes the beautiful light and, the, the, and, and myself I would direct a bit and then somebody uh, by memory will tell a monologue of Shakespeare I I don't see any use uh, in in, uh, in doing this I like it huh? I always as a mm -hmm. child I liked sitting outside and watching it as you said this distance and being kind of surrounded not by walls but by um, it, it, it's beautiful, we should do it, but we should really also like rethink what is the act of doing theater. Because when the Greeks did theater, it was kind of directly linked to their political scene at all. You know, it was kind of really, I think you have Mr. Schechner tomorrow. 
Yes, um, and he can uh, he can tell you a lot about the ritual of doing theater when the young man came back came back from the war, and then the big Dionysic uh, festival was happening, and they were dramatically talking about what happened. If we can reopen this space of where the traumas of society and there are a lot after these months that we are now at home, dying or not dying or whatever, comes out and we have a festival like this and we have a meeting and we use theater again as a real meeting, not just taking a ticket with a beautiful dress, sitting down in the hall, watching from the black into the, in the, into the, into the light, etc., etc. But we reinvent this meeting space as theater, especially after a time when meeting was impossible, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy, but I'm extremely afraid that the aestheticization, I don't know if the aestheticization of, mm -hmm. of like, for example, the movements you do in the street when you don't want to, to meet and that we, you know, or the, the, this, this little mask in Mozart operas, we will see all this on stage, of course. Mm -hmm. We will have the aestheticization of everything. And if this happens, that we just introduce all this new knowledge in the old way of making, we do the same karaoke of the old canon we did before, but just with new, some new gadgets. Yeah. And in fact, then we learn yeah. anything. Yeah. You know? And people make money off it or want to advance their careers. I mean, the Greek theater, of course, also the beauty was you would see the city of Athens in the back, you know, from this theater. the theater. The city was really the backdrop. Gods were in the temples. People believed they were, you know, in there watching. You spoke to them, actually, and not so much often to the audiences. So, so, um, so you would say on a square in Ghent, you create a school where people, uh, so like you said, they're like writing a play with the people in the city, but what, I don't know if you could share some of the idea, I would be interested, what, what are you planning to do on those squares in Ghent? You know, uh, by, a bit by accident, we anyway made a decision even before this uh, Corona mm -hmm. crisis happened, uh, to have a season that is not a season like the last one. Because the first season, it's my third season as an artistic yeah, director, yeah. and the first season was a kind of revolutionary one. So we, we created what we called Global Ensemble with a lot of people, non-actors, actors, dancers, just people, even animals. So we really opened the idea of, of doing theater to all living somehow. The second season was kind of, we, are, we were like using the, the manifesto, the rules, the ensemble, and you made a very successful theater, like new classics, as we call the it. The altar piece, yeah. The mm -hmm. altar piece, for example. Um, and in the first season, we decided to go not only on the streets in Ghent, because Ghent is just an example. It's just a city. Ghent is everywhere, and everything is into Ghent. You would find a lot of Americans, a lot of people, even from Amazonia, in this city, like in every city. So. Uh, going outside, for example, as I said, going to schools, for example, going to neighborhoods, going to Amazonia, going uh, a bit everywhere and mm -hmm. trying to exchange. This is the this is the plan we have. But of course, this is the the, the formalistic choices. For example, we yeah. have uh, Luanda Casella, which is a director from from Brazil, living in Ghent, or we have Lara Stahl, which is a curator from from Amsterdam. Um, and it depends from them how they decide to do it. For example, Luanda Casella likes a lot of kind of playful universities. So she does a, a play that is called Killjoy uh, Quiz. Um, and, uh, and she will work with people in that way. I think I would more work when I do then preparing my project. Uh, I'm more the assembly guy. So I like assemblies. I like political actions. Uh, I, one plan I have, uh, I would really as fast we can we can travel again i would go like to go to the refugee camps open them making in the borders of europe making their occupations giving houses to the people because the strange thing is in south italy or in greece where you have the biggest camps there you also have the most of the houses just empty so yeah. you have a lot of space that is not Lots of space and mm -hmm. just because of the contradiction of the of the political system because these people is not legal so I would use the theater as a machine of legalization and taking home, for example. That would be a project. I would prefer to invest money in this uh, than invest, as I said, in, in uh, making a beautiful um, little gadgets to make a beautiful play in my big hall. So this is, a, for me, the, a bit the, 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 at least the beginning of, of when we can restart to really reinvent the act 
Um, it's not going about uh, about going into the, the streets. I, I can imagine that somebody, and for example, if we come back to Peter Brook, you can do in a very classical space, uh, you can do something that is changing, you know? It's, it's not about where you do it. It's perhaps even not about with whom you are doing it. For me, it's the context and the actors are extremely important. So all my aesthetics depend from where I do it and with whom, but you can have another approach. So I saw incredible plays that are absolutely not interested in what I, I'm taking as an as mm -hmm. as entry uh, step to, to use the real act of, of, of theater. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, that is um, fascinating, interesting that you <clears throat> you also you went to university, you studied, uh, you also worked as a journalist, Remini were journalist. In a way, you are prepared in a way for um, adapting, you know, new forms and to rethink things. And that um, perhaps um, um, this is a, an additional um, um, qualification that helps to, um, to I think to, to one, find forms. Yeah, one one thing. Um, that is important. I think theater is a form of crisis. I think theater is not really existing in a, in a, in a just going on society. What we had now for a long time, and I was raised in it, was the idea of doing karaoke with some classics. And then on the little stages, you, you, you would try out. But take Shakespeare. Shakespeare, when he made his Hamlet, there were a lot of Hamlets. He just could have used one, you know? Mm -hmm. And he didn't do it because he said, no, I have my ensemble and I have my, my interest and I have my public and I want to do it now. And it's very strange that then we decided to his now, who was a very specific now, to kind of take it again and again and again and not adapt it to our now. And I think in moments of crisis, for a moment, the whole story that it will continue forever as it was and you can do forever the same, just a bit change from season to season breaks. And you feel this time is over, you have to invent something new. And that's why I'm, I'm extremely thankful to being here now um, and have the chance to do theater and to think, so what do we really need? What so you, means gathering? What means an assembly? What means presence? What, what is it actually? What is this act of together decide that this is reality and not that, but this now? What is it? Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is an important question to ask. So you are sure this is a real rapture we are living through now? This is a real disruption? You know, you can, I think you can lift the biggest disruptions and you see it in human history and you can just avoid to see it. And this is extremely dangerous. I think if we don't see it now, if we don't, and that's why I'm kind of, of, of coming back again and again to what you could call the tragic knowledge that you understand that the time we are living in is not only dramatic, it's tragic. I, I, Schorsch Steiner, a very beautiful philologist um, uh, who was teaching in Switzerland, by the way, in Geneva too, mm -hmm. Um, he was writing a book called The Death of Tragedy, and he was saying that, for example, when you compare Ibsen with Sophocles in the play of Ibsen, that's just drama, because you give yeah. a bit of more women rights, a bit more of whatever, and everything will be fine. Yeah? The society yeah. in itself is okay, you just give a bit more rights and a bit more identity politics, and everybody will be happy, every minority, but now we feel this time of neoliberal not changing everything, but just find the compromise for everybody is over. Tragic times are here. And we, are, we have to watch like this on our time because we don't do it. Of course, we can go on for 20 years more, for 30 years perhaps, but then it really will be too late. And then we don't have any choice anymore. And the objective powers will be too strong. So now we have still a certain uh, space to navigate. And I think we should, we should, we should really use it. Mm -hmm. We should use our knowledge, if it's a journalistic knowledge or a scientist knowledge or a, a knowledge as, a, as, a, as, a, as an artist. Um, it's a call and we should, we should hear it. We shouldn't mm -hmm. avoid to... We shouldn't to avoid it. it. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we are coming close um, to, to the end. So I think you, to say this is really, a, this is a it was very serious statement that this is a tragic time we live in, in the crisis we should actually experience it and the ideas, the remedy also, you know, crisis and healing that, uh, but it is serious and we not to pretend it's a squeak story that happened 2000 years ago. No, this, our life in a way depends on, 
on how we see and how we interpret stories and how we react to it. And it's about our lives actually, and not about the lives of these people on the stage or the, the actors are representing it. This is really about us. And um, as a closing question, um, they are a lot, lots of theater makers young ones who decide should i go in or out like you could be the young mila rao listening to mila rao now what would you say to a young artist when you said i was still sitting at home and studying and reading and should i go into theater should i do art what kind of art? what kind of advice would you would you give i mean thomas ostermeyer said prepare you know this will be over nothing lasts forever the fight is coming afterwards um, what is you, what? What would you say? What should people really do? Maybe our audience, as you know, but also as theater artists, what what is the what is demanded of them or us at the moment? Um, I mean, what I'm always saying to the young uh, Milo Raus is uh, connect and do one thing and do it the most simple you can. So I mean, making art is taking decisions. And you never know. And this is perhaps another step of the tragic knowledge that, of course, you don't know how it will become. You just try, you fail, you try again, and you try and you try and you go on. And then you should connect with the most interesting and most, I don't know, for you, most interesting people that you can react uh, faster than you could when you are alone. So for me, the act of solidarity, the act of togetherness is the most important in, uh, in theater. You can't sit at home and prepare and read. This is important and it's beautiful, as I said, but after three, four weeks, I mean, for a theater maker, that's not writing, you know? It's not how you, how you, how you can work. You can only work collectively. And I think this is extremely important that even if you become older and you have more power, of course, and you are more alone and you can more decide and you less depend from what the other think, the more stupid actually you become, the more disconnected you become what you should do and what you, what you have to do. You know, I was, I was reading in the last days, I was reading Oedipus, uh, Tyrannos, so the King, King Oedipus. Uh, by Sophocles. And the interesting thing is he's surrounded by experts and everybody from the beginning of the play on says, you killed your mother, uh, you killed your father, you fucked your mother, you killed your... The reason of the, of, the, of, the, of the virus, I mean, it's the most interesting play about Corona, by the way, but it's not adapted at all. That's you. You are the problem. Your power, which seems so rational, is perverse. And I think to understand this, that we actually know everything. We only have to act. We only have to take decisions. This is what I would, uh, what I would propose. And I have always to propose to myself too. I think that, okay, let's plan the season. Let's write the play. Let's do this. Let's plan. It's impossible. I mean, this is really tragic uh, knowledge. It's impossible mm -hmm. to do any plan. Don't and in, in, in some way, the interesting thing of the underlying curse that Laios Oedipus' father was cursed <clears throat> because he he abused, uh, molested a young kid, a child which was in his uh, care, and he was cursed, your son will kill you and sleep with your wife, which Oedipus also didn't know about, the, the underlying curses, the invisible ones, which we are also dealing with, and these are um, um, formations and currents um, you know, we it, have to do, yeah. I think it makes us humble to understand that we are Oedipus and we are living in a cursed civilization, and that we from the West, we did so many mistakes that it's fine, we are cursed, and perhaps we should now learn from the others. We should somehow shut up and try to learn and to learn yeah. fast. Yeah, this is, this is a great, great, great advice, Milo, and thank you for taking the time, thank you for taking this so serious, and I hope also that your, your golden book publications go great. I guess uh, what to do with the theater, is you gonna publish it yourself also? Uh, the white the, theater book, you yeah. mean? Yeah, yeah, is yeah, it part yeah, of your yeah. golden book, which is remarkable. You're a filmmaker, theater maker, publicist, journalist, you write, political activist, really uh, a model. Hans Lehmann said a house is like the theater. It has many rooms and there are all the rooms for someone who does traditional <laughs> comedia to this or that, you know, but um, also you occupy a special place, maybe unlocked with a key, you know, mm -hmm. a, a room that might, we all didn't know. It was there like Remini and so, so uh, many others and they're part of that permanent revolution and some say you know it takes 100 to 150 years from revolutions going from the most conservative then you know and heading to ultimately liberal things but it takes a while it takes years and it's nothing is fast and uh, but we have to be on the right side and uh, of, of history and of justice and social progress 
and you certainly are. And so thank you for, for sharing your time tomorrow. As uh, you said, we have the Richard Schackner as a the great yeah, singer and philosopher of theater. I'm I can't a, wait a big fan. A yeah, big to fan. hear what he has to say because he's also someone who really comments uh, uh, on, on our society and he's always right um, on, uh, on target. We'll have Arthur Nuziciel uh, who is uh, coming from France and uh, Guillermo Calderon will be with us. And then also Basil Jones, a great theater artist from South Africa and uh, yeah. works with puppets yeah. and did great work. He did the Wojciech and the Tooth Commission and other things. So um, it is uh, really enlightening for us and it's a privilege to hear and listen. And thank you really again for sharing. And uh, It's a privilege I, to be here and I will follow you. tomorrow as a spectator. Thank you. Thank you, Milo. And um, thank you all uh, for listening. I know so much content is out there. We at the Seagull always say we need great theater and performance, but we also need a great audience, an audience That's who it. does something. So the audience is as significant and as important. And this is one of the changes we, Milo is fighting for. It's about you who listen. So thank you and tune in again. And thanks for HowlRound at Emerson College, uh, VJ and Thea for hosting us and the Siegel team, Sun Yang, May and Jackie. And uh, talk to you soon. And we'll hopefully one day we'll meet in the weeks thank out, you. Weeks out we that you come meet. to the Siegel. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao. Thanks. Ciao.